O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our be seated and we will join to sing Psalm 31 as printed on the insert. We will sing the verses responsively by the double verse and join in the glory be to the Father and the refrain. taken refuge, let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me, come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. I trust in the Lord. Merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish, and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction, and my bones grow weak.
Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. The history of the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ according to a harmony of the four Gospels. Part 5, the crucifixion and death of Jesus and the burial of Jesus. Then the soldiers took Jesus. They took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him and he carried his cross. And as they came out, they find him, found a man who was coming out of the country, Simon of Cyrene by name, who was the father of Alexander and Rufus. They compelled him to carry the cross for him and laid the cross on him that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him and the women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. But weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, 
the wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? And there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And they brought him to the place, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, that is to say, the place of a skull. And they gave him sour wine mingled with myrrh to drink. And when he had tasted it, he would not drink. And they crucified him at the place, Golgotha, and the two criminals with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and Jesus in the center. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And Pilate wrote a title, the accusation against him, the reason for his death, and they put it on the cross over his head. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. The soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also his tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said before among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and that my, for my clothing they cast lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders along with the people, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, the chosen of God, let him save himself, and now come down from the cross, that we may see and believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard it said, This man is calling for Elijah. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. And immediately one of them ran, took a sponge, and filled it with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth for him to drink. But the others said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And again he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said that, 
he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And the grave, the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion who stood opposite him and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw that they, he cried out like this and saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they greatly feared and praised God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Truly, this was the Son of God. And all the multitude who came together to that site, seeing the things which were done, beat their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joses, and Salome the mother of Zebedee's sons, who followed him when he was in Galilee, ministering to him and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be, be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who saw it bore witness, and his witness is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, they will look on him whom they pierced. The burial of Jesus. And now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, a prominent council member, a good and just man, who had not consented to their counsel and deed, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, for he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Coming and taking courage, he went into Pilate and asked that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And calling the centurion to him, he asked if he had been dead for some time. And when he found out from the centurion, he commanded the body to be given to him. And Joseph bought fine linen. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus, which had been taken down, and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and bound it with strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, which was Joseph's, which was hewn out of the rock, in which no one had ever been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, and the Sabbath drew near, for the tomb was nearby. And they rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and Mary, the mother of Joses, sitting opposite the tomb, also other women who had followed Jesus from Galilee. And they observed how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and rested on the Sabbath, according to the commandment. Now the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night. Steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. 
In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. We join in the Passion Hymn printed on the, the, sort of the insert, hymn insert.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is it right for us to be sad, to mourn, to weep, to lament Jesus' death? Understand we do not observe Passion Season and Good Friday as some kind of funeral for Jesus. We do not mourn for him as we do at our own funerals, that that we will weep for our loved one because we're going to miss them so much. That is not how we would weep for Jesus or mourn his death. For Good Friday is good. And Jesus' death on the cross is our greatest treasure, our greatest joy and comfort in all of life and in death. And yet I think there would be something wrong with us if it did not move us. If not to tears, because tears come more easily for some than for others, at least to sorrow, to some emotional disturbance or reaction of some sort indicating that something here is not right. I mean, if at Jesus' death, even the sun hid its face and refused to shine, I would think it should have some impact upon us who are not rocks or sticks but human beings like him who, are, who, are made, who have been created to feel things, even to rejoice and to weep. Even Jesus had said, Blessed are those who mourn now, for they shall be comforted. It is not surprising that women followed Jesus, those who followed Jesus to the cross mourned, and lamented because what they saw was sad. Jesus had already by this time suffered greatly at the hands of Pilate and his soldiers. He was bloodied from their whips and their scourge. He was bruised from being struck on the head again and again. And now he had laid upon him his own cross, the instrument of his own execution, rough heavy timbers laid upon his back. Many people followed Jesus that day. Not all of them were sympathetic. You had your curious spectators following this site with the kind of interest that that had citizens in the days of Rome to watch people as they fought and were torn apart in gladiatorial combat in the Colosseum. Others followed in opposition, venting their scorn, crying out in mockery, expressing their their devilish joy that Jesus was going to die. But you also had those who once, once shouted to him to save. Those who cried out, Hosanna on Palm Sunday. Those who had once expressed some allegiance toward him or at least respect for him, but now they remained silent, fearing that public support for him now could or would jeopardize some of their own temporal interests. But they followed. There's one group in particular that that interests us this evening, following our Lord, some women who it says were deeply moved and and seemed sincerely interested and attached to him. They mourned and lamented, it says. And they expressed sorrow over what they saw before them, such a good, innocent man suffering such injustice. And they were right. So I think you would expect Jesus at this moment to approve such mourning. 
They were sympathetic with him, all the more so in contrast to all the scorn and the hatred that was swirling around him. But to our surprise, Jesus doesn't approve. He says to them, don't weep for me. And it's not so much in the sense of, ah, you don't need to bother about me, like, like you'd hear from Eeyore or something like that, like, no big deal, don't worry about me. He's not so much comforting them either, like, don't cry. It is rather a bit of a rebuke. Do not weep for me. The reason that they were weeping for Jesus, we suppose, was that they recognized that his suffering was unjust. This was not right. We could guess that, for they did not weep like this for every criminal who was getting what his deeds deserved. But this was wrong. Indeed, what they did to Jesus was wrong, and it was cruel, and it was brutal. So these women lamented what a bunch of evil men were doing to a very good man. And that is true. But what I suppose they did not consider is that among the evil ones who caused this was also them. See, it was their sins too which brought about unjust suffering upon the Holy One. It's one thing to mourn. Things aren't the way they are. But when our prideful, sinful hearts assume that the the injustice is out there and not also beginning here, Jesus says, do not weep for me. Or perhaps, if they did somehow recognize their part in it. Maybe they also thought that that their grief and their sorrow could somehow make up for the wrong that they had done. For their silence when they should have spoken, or their lack of devotion to him. Do not weep for me, Jesus said, but weep for yourselves. He went on to say, for if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? In other words, here is why you should weep. If if this is how they treat an innocent one, how do you think sinners will be treated? How should you be treated? If you think this is sad, Jesus' horrific suffering and cruel treatment, how much worse will it be for you to face the full wrath of God for your own sin? Do not weep for me, Jesus says, but for yourselves and for your children. But still, what good will crying do? We know Drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Like Peter weeping outside the high priest's court, our tears will never make up for what we have done. So do not weep tears of pity or tears meant to prove our loyalty or our level of sorrow. Rather, Jesus instructs, Weep tears of repentance. Yes, tears of sorrow over our own guilt and our own shame. But more than that, for us who continue to follow him, for us who who see our Lord going on, uncomplaining, that is, without complaint, without Lament. See, the truth is, we see Jesus on the cross and we see him to the end. Jesus, Jesus does lament. He does cry out upon the cross 
He does that when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He does cry out against what is definitely not just or right. But here is the key. When he cries out, he does not cry out against you, against your injustice. His suffering is unjust, but he does not attack you. Listen, especially next Friday on Good Friday, listen. As we hear the whole of Psalm 22, which begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But watch how Jesus laments. Watch how he prays. He prays, O Lord, be not far off. Come quickly to my aid. The whole thing is a song of trust. Or likewise, Psalm 31 that we sang this this evening. In our time of, of sorrow, when it says, when my life is consumed, my eyes grow weak with sorrow, my body and soul with grief, my life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. In distress, he sings, I trust in you, O God. Into your hands I commend my spirit. So do not weep for Jesus. Weep in repentance. But learn from Jesus' cries, his lamenting. Learn in those to be comforted. Know in his cries of faith and trust that you also have the certainty. One, that he does not hold your sin, any of it, even thoughts, even doubts, against you. And two, know that too, that even in the face of anything in life that may cause you sorrow, whether you are weeping tears of regret for mistakes and wrongs, or you are mourning unjustly for the, from the sins of others, whatever it is, Jesus cry, Jesus lament, even his tears, his perfect lament in faith and trust also stands in your sad place too. Yes, weep in repentance. Weep for yourself and for your children. But let Jesus cry and lament cover you and your sins, and all your sorrows. So that the word of the psalmist might be fulfilled that says those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. So that your tears of sorrow over sin may be planted in him, buried in him, left to rot forever in his tomb, never to see the light of day and stay there forever. While your Lord, your living Lord, comes out of that tomb with new life to give and peace and joy. Amen. Please stand. We join to sing the song of Mary, the Magnificat, as printed in the service folder. My soul now may.
The Lord be with you. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. And also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.